Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I'd like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. I want you to go in your Bibles today to the books of, book of Acts. Not the books, but the book, but not an act of the Holy Spirit, but the acts. Amen. Praise God. That's good. Plural. And uh, not the ending of the acts of the Holy Spirit. All right? Because it's always the book of Acts. Chapter 2. How could we not go to Acts chapter 2? I don't know what anybody else is doing. But <laughs> I know Pentecostal churches all over the world are in Acts chapter 2 today. Praise God. They might be in Acts chapter 10 or uh, 18, they, they might be in Isaiah, they could be in Joel, but uh, many are in the book of Acts chapter 2. We're going to see, I think, something a little bit new. We're going to see the same story. We're going to see much of what we already know, but a slightly different aspect, a, a hopefully a fresh revelation for you. Uh, this has not been a week for me that was e extraordinarily helpful spiritually in the way I'm feeling. But I know that my spirit has been encouraged. And I know that I have had a time with the Lord that was refreshing. Uh, we came home, Sister Pam and I came home on Thursday for a little bit. Friday morning I walked Rocky Gap and just had a beautiful time with the Lord um, out there. And then I walked yesterday at my mom and dad's as I had done all week. And I did not walk this morning. When I walk at my mom and dad's, right across the road, just diagonally across the road from their house, is a cemetery, the cemetery for our little town. And um, they dug my dad's grave on Tuesday, I believe it was. So I walk past that every morning. And um, I didn't want to do that today. Because now the, the grave's covered. And there's a part of who he was in this life there. But that's not where my attention is. That's not where my focus is. Amen. I told Sister Pam on the way home today, I had four people in my life that depended on wheelchairs, four people very close. And in this last year, 12 calendar months, all four of them are with the Lord now. Brother John Little in Florida, who was a part of this church growing up for many years, and he um, didn't always have to have a wheelchair, but these last couple of years. But, Br but Brother Barry Mason from here in town, they, he and Sister Susan attended here years ago, and then, of course, Brother Doug Moody and my father. And um, they all knew each other, and they encouraged each other at different times. And they're all together now. <laughs> Praise God. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. On the day of Pentecost... All the believers were meeting together in one place. Many of us know it from the King James. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all together in one accord. Now, we have, and rightfully so, we've put much emphasis in the church, in the Pentecostal church over the years, on that one accord. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. That was important. But I don't think there could be any disagreement that the, they, they didn't intentionally work towards the one accord. They didn't have to. In other words, we sometimes emphasize that they all came into agreement. But that's not the purpose of them getting together. The purpose of them getting together was to obey Jesus. And when they all did that, the Bible says they were in one accord. It really doesn't matter where you are geographically, physically. It doesn't matter what you're going through, struggling with, facing, trying to overcome. If you and I are focused on, dedicated to, surrendered to obeying Jesus Christ, we will come into this building each week in one accord. 
Now, listen, lots of people are trying to obey religion, denominations. Lots of people are trying to obey Christianity and American Christianity, but very few are trying to obey Jesus Christ because he's a dividing line. He divides everything. He'll divide you from your denomination. He'll divide you from your theological beliefs. He'll divide you from your superstitions, your family hang-ups. He'll divide you so much so that that knife of his, that sword, will even separate your soul and your spirit so that you can understand just how corrupt and fallen. So I can realize how unredeemable my flesh is, my mind, my soul, so that I am utterly dependent on him touching my spirit and my spirit living for him and having dominion over my flesh. Well, anyways, (laughs) one accord. What happened on the day of Pentecost in 33 A.D.? Uh, The Tanzanian church in East Africa, the Tanzanian Assemblies of God are already planning Pentecost 2000. Now, I don't mean like the year 2000. That's past already. But in 2033, right? No. What what year are we in? (laughs) I'm my mom's son here all of a sudden. Um, <laughs> uh, it's been a week. Uh, so is this, this is not 21 something, right? 2020? Is it? No, 2021. Good Lord, help us here. Come on. Did you give me my medicine today? <laughs> You know I don't like numbers to start with, right? And those ones just weren't coming together. Anyways, I knew there was one in there somewhere. Anyways, in 2033, it'll be the 2,000-year anniversary, give or take, but we're pretty sure. Uh, And they've already begun plans of celebrating the outpouring of the Holy Spirit 2,000 years after the day. Now, glory to God for planning. I am praying against them. I hope Jesus Christ returns a whole lot sooner than 2033. Amen? (laughs) Uh, But what happened on the day of Pentecost in A.D. 33? I don't know what's going to happen in 2033, but what happened then? Well, one of the things that we recognize here is that all the known believers, everybody committed to Jesus Christ. I mean life-changing, committed. They were in this upper room. That's what we know. Not that they were all together in one accord, yes, but that they were all there. Because their pursuit was the will of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they wanted to do, to obey him, to be there until whatever happened. He told them, wait for the promise of the Father. I'm not sure they had any idea. Listen, somebody can promise you a new car, right? Right? How many of you aren't too sure what you're getting until you see it in the driveway? How many of you are hoping for a 2021 Mercedes 500 SL? Thank you, Greg. I see that hand. How many of you are going to be very disappointed if you open the door and it's a Toyota Prius? 2012 model, and they say, hey, it's not brand new, but it's new to you. You can get a promise, but you don't know what that promise is until you've got it. And so that's what begins to unfold here. Let's look at verse 2 now. Acts chapter 2 and verse 2. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Number one, something came suddenly. What happened? 2,000 years ago in that upper room there near the temple when all the believers are gathered together waiting for the promise of the Father and doing it in obedience to Jesus. What happened? Well, this is the first thing that we know that happened. Luke has made research, careful research and study, and he's interviewed people. He wasn't there, but this is what we know. Something came suddenly. Interestingly, no one... Even among those who was there, no one was exactly sure what had come suddenly. Yeah, let's read it again, verse 2. And suddenly 
There was a sound from heaven like the roaring of my... Listen, it sounded like a windstorm, but, but it, it wasn't. It, it was something that came suddenly, but we, we can't tell you exactly what it was. We can tell you what the sound was, and, and we can tell you what it, it imitated. It was like a big windstorm, but, but I can't tell you, Luke, exactly what it was that, that, that we were seeing there or hearing in that wind, but it came suddenly. We can tell you that. This is what we do know. It came suddenly. Now, you know, in the King James, that word's there, in the New Living, that word's there, and you know this is an important word in the things of God, right? Suddenly. Yeah, suddenly. So in the Old Testament, in Joshua 6.20, suddenly the walls of Jericho collapsed. You know, I love it when you're praying about something in your life. You're praying for victory. You're praying for a deliverance. You're praying for a breakthrough. And you've been praying and praying and you've seen something but not enough. And then you feel like seven steps backwards and you're not sure. Now it's three years later. And where did all that time go? And you're still laboring. And then you're saying, well, maybe I should just quit because God's probably disappointed with me for not getting this victory sooner. I should have had this a long time ago. I know the Lord. I'm so weak. He must hate me. God's done with me. He rejects me because I'm a terrible believer. Maybe I'm not even a believer. I should just quit going to church. And Can I stop or do you understand what happens to you, right? Yeah, I know it because I'm in your house every... No, no, I know it because it happens to me too. My, I have a, a cousin who lives in Columbus, Ohio. He told Sister Pam more of this than me. But um, he was burdened when I was in Pakistan at a particular moment. And uh, the Lord told him that things were happening to try and get me and my team out of, to, to leave Pakistan. And he began to pray and intercede. And that's when that television monitor screen system was falling. There's a rack like that up there made out of steel. And it was three or four times longer than that. It had a television monitors all mounted to it. Every one of them was five or 600 pounds, and there were several dozen of them mounted there, and it came down and hit the couches where we were sitting, crushed those couches, hit so hard it bounced back up and came back down again. We had just stood up, the whole team, all of us, to wave the Pakistan flag. Meanwhile, halfway around the world, God was burdening my cousin. Yeah. We, we don't know... Sometimes what we're going through, and it's the culmination of a lot of time invested coming here to church, giving financially, taking your time to be a part of what's happening, teaching, singing, worshiping. But there comes a time when God decides it's suddenly, it's now, it's suddenly. And what we, here's something else we read in the Old Testament, 2 Kings 2.11. As they were walking and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared, and Elijah was carried to heaven. He and Elisha are walking and talking, but suddenly. Now already Elijah has prophesied over Elisha and said, yes, you're going to be my, uh, my replacement, so to speak. And if you see the chariot of fire come, or if you see me go to heaven, you will get the double portion that you're asking for. And Elisha, you know, full of faith and confidence, has, has asked for this thing. I, I just want a double portion. You don't understand how a double portion comes. So he's celebrating. Just give me a double portion. I just want everything you've got. But when that chariot of fire comes, friend, he's not sure he's even going to live. You hear him cry out, my Lord and my God, the chariots of Israel. And the Bible says that thing appeared suddenly. But Elijah and Elisha had not been with God just suddenly. They had invested time, right? Spent time, took time. In Psalm 64, 7, it says, God himself will shoot our enemies with his arrows, suddenly striking them down. Praise God. Suddenly he will strike down your enemies. Quote that. You can, that's one of those ones you can write down. Not that the others aren't. But you can write it down, and whatever you're going through, you can quote that verse and say, God, would you come suddenly and strike down my enemies? Well, pastor... I don't, I'm not supposed to have enemies. And if I do, I'm supposed to pray for them. That's exactly what Jesus said. Pray for your enemies. God, I pray that you would come and suddenly strike down my enemies, just like the Bible tells me. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know what the Lord says? Check. <laughs> He's praying. I just told him to pray. I didn't tell him how to pray. <laughs> He's praying. We, listen, if, if that's not the correct approach 
as you're praying that, and I don't mean a minute or a day, but over a period of time as you're praying that, if you're the one that needs to move, God's Holy Spirit will move you. If I'm the one that needs to see it differently, if I'm the one that needs to build a bridge, reach out, if I need to pray a different way, by praying at all, God will direct me to praying correctly. Right? When we're believers in walking with God, we're not in concrete unflexible, unwilling to move or change. What we're saying is, I surrender. This is what I want, but I surrender. And every time I pray to you, God, I'm praying for it to be my way, but I'm surrendering to your way. Because somebody said, nevertheless, Father, not my will, but your will be done. And that's the one we follow. Amen? Number one, something came suddenly. And the final Old Testament reference I want you to listen to is from Ruth chapter 3 verse 8. Around midnight, now this is a little different context, but hold this one tight, okay? Around midnight, Boaz suddenly woke up. Around midnight, Boaz, and you know he's a type of who? Yeah, he's the great-great-grandfather of David. And he's the type of Jesus Christ in this story. And suddenly, suddenly he woke up. The psalmist often cried out, David among them, Lord, would you, would you wake, awaken, stir yourself, and come to my defense? I'm paraphrasing. But again and again in the psalms we see that. Do you think God sleeps? I Personally, I don't see any, any proof in the word of God that he's sleeping. Elijah even mocked the others, the prophets of Baal, and said, well, maybe your God's out on vacation. Maybe your God's at the bathroom. Maybe your God is asleep. But our God doesn't do that. Amen? The living God doesn't. But the Bible sometimes helps us to understand that we can feel like he's sleeping. And the Bible says that Boaz suddenly woke up. When you're praying and praying and crying and holding on to almost nothing, there's just nothing left for you to hold on to except a tiny little thread that Jesus might be something, somewhere that you can believe in, hopefully. And you've prayed and prayed and prayed and just turned to walk away. And suddenly he wakes up to your situation. Boaz suddenly woke up. He was surprised to find a woman lying at his feet. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Number two, Acts chapter 2, verse 3. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. Now, are you beginning to see a pattern here? Something that sounded like wind and now something that looked like fire. Hey, guys, you were there. I wasn't. I've come late to the party. I'm traveling around with Paul. I keep hearing about the day of Pentecost. So I just want to know, you know, I'm, I'm going to make a very careful record of all of this. You may not see the importance of it, but I think even in that experience, we need to give a record for the church to know exactly what happened. Now, you told me that the wind came suddenly, but, but it really wasn't wind, but you're not sure what it was. And now you're telling me that something came like fire, but it really wasn't fire. So what, how, how are you okay with having had an experience that you can't describe? Number two today, something settled on them. They didn't know what it was that had come suddenly, but they knew it came suddenly. They didn't know what it was that came on them, but they knew it settled. We get so distracted with the thought of the wind and the fire that we miss what Luke's trying to convey to us. It's not the wind or the fire. It wasn't wind and it wasn't necessarily fire. It was something that looked like that, but they don't know what it was. If it was fire, they would have all died. But what we do know is it settled on them. That's the key. It came suddenly and it settled on them. We don't know exactly what that wind was or the sound. We don't know exactly what the sight was. But we do know that it settled. Now listen to these from the Old Testament. 
Exodus 14.20, the cloud settled between the Egyptian and Israelite camps. The Egyptian and Israelites, the Egyptians and Israelites did not approach each other all night. Remember that, that pillar or that column of cloud in the day that became fire at night. And the Bible says it settled in between the camps. There is something that's settled in between you and Satan and his demons. There's something that's defending you, protecting you, preserving you, that's always with you. There's something that has settled. When you said yes to Jesus, you said yes to a settling presence that delivers you from the enemy, that keeps you out of his clutches, that protects you through air. But pastor, I went through it. You'll go through things. Sure, but there is something that's settled with you. You can't describe it. If the scientist comes or the physicist, you can say, well, it sometimes feels like this. It sometimes makes me feel this way, or I think it's that, but I can't show it to you. I, I, I don't know exactly how to even describe it. I don't even know how to tell you what it is, but I can tell you it's settled. When I gave my life to Jesus, it settled in me. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's settled, and it's between you and his camp. Here's another one from Exodus 24. The glory of the Lord settled down on Mount Sinai, and the Lord called to Moses from inside the cloud. Everyone saw it settled right down on that mountain. Did you see that volcano yesterday in Africa? I think it was in Congo. started uh, erupting, and people were just fleeing. I mean, those things are amazingly beautiful but they are terrifyingly destructive. We were in uh, one Central American country. I've made more volcano tours than I care to count. Uh, there's one in Nicaragua. You can get right up to the edge of it. In the United States, you would have to stay a mile and a half away, have a hazmat suit on. This one just has a sign there. If you stand here more than 10 minutes, you might die from carbon monoxide. <laughs> and... Uh, they make you, when you come into the parking lot in the vehicle, you can go into, it's a park, a national park. You can come in your own vehicle or your little tour groups can bring in, but they make you back in. Because if they start yelling, you've got to jump in your vehicle and get out. You've got to go before the rocks fall on you because it spits up every once in a while. So I've been there a lot of times. We were one, I think it was in, I wanted to say El Salvador, but I think it was Costa Rica. And Pastor Salvador and I and uh, Pastor Santiago, who used to be a, a part of my team, we, we went and visited this one because Pastor Santiago's wife's from Costa Rica, and this one's like almost 10,000 feet. you got to see this volcano. And the whole way there I'm saying, Lord, it's a hole in the ground, and it's hot. I've seen 10 of them. Well, I've seen one seven times, and I've seen three other ones. <laughs> So we go up there, and I, I forget why or who, but one big tour group was from Asia, maybe Japan. And so we go over, and I'm telling you, it's just clouds. You're going to look down in it. You're at 9,000 feet in the little parking area, and then you look down, and it is clouds for a half a mile, just. And so Pastor Santiago said, well, too bad we won't get to see the volcano today. And I said, ah, you know, I kinda, this one's kind of cool. I don't know what made me think this one's different, but I'd like to see in this one. And so... With all those people standing around, many of whom probably didn't know what I was saying, we half, not, not jokingly, but not like super spiritual, but we said, you know, Jesus, this is something we'd like to see. And in your mighty name, we pray that these clouds would part so we can look into that volcano. Gang, before I said amen, it was like a hand just went it instantly. In two seconds, the clouds went like this, and all the Japanese people went, ooh. I don't know that they heard anything I said. It was out loud, I wasn't yelling or anything, but just loud enough that the people close by could have heard it. And Pastor Santiago and I and uh, Pastor Salvador started taking pictures, just like we were one of the Japanese folks, you know, taking a lot of pictures. And I said to the Lord, I don't understand why you do these kinds of things. It would have been better for you not to do that so that I could say, well, I wasn't being spiritual enough or I didn't earn it or deserve it. But now you've done this thing in an instant when there have been hundreds of things I've been very spiritual about, very, very, very tenacious, and, and, and I just knew that I needed it, and I got nothing. Not even a tiny little puff of wind. <laughs> but if you heard me open in prayer this morning, for most of those, I am eternally grateful that God did not answer. 
I didn't know it at the time, but over the years, over the years, we, he and I are still negotiating about the, the lottery money that's out here floating around somewhere. Somebody here in our county or the next county over hit the lottery or won or whatever you call it for $730 million. So I've said to the Lord, if, uh, initially we were negotiating for all of it, but I've scaled back and I'm negotiating only for a tithe. I've said to the Lord in our negotiations, I'll take a tithe if they take 30-year payments or I'll take the tithe if they take it all at once. 30-year payments, I think you get $25 million. I'm Like I'm not a numbers guy and I really haven't run the numbers too much. But uh, I think about $25 million, $22, $3 million a year for 30 years. Or five hundred and some million. So I'm taking a tithe either way. Who's with me? So in these negotiations, I had the Holy Spirit, my advocate, on my side. And we've been going kind of back and forth with God, negotiating. But in the middle of the negotiations, my representative went over and had conversations with the other side. Well, I appreciate that. I do. That's what you do in negotiations. Mediation. So my attorney, the Holy Spirit, my advocate, he went over and, and talked to the other side to help them to see my position. But then he started not only conferring with the other side, that's good. Then he began to concur with the other side. That's not good. You, you, you don't want your representative, your advocate, the Holy Spirit, conferring with the other side and then concurring with the other side. Then, while he's over there, he begins to convict me. Now I'm like, well, wait, we're not at trial here. We're just in negotiations. I know you're an attorney, and attorneys do this, is what they do. But why would you convict me? I don't need convicted. I know where I stand. I want to negotiate so that side sees my position. And that's where it stays. You'll stay with me. I've told you about this a few times. And I'll give you the answer as soon as we get there. How many of you have a pretty good idea where this is going? Huh? How many of you don't think, like, a dime is coming my way? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is the Holy Spirit. And what we have to understand is that he's always conferring with the King of glory. He's always sharing his heart, his position, his will. He knows the mind of God, and he shares that with us if we're willing to not only allow him to confer with the other side of eternity, but then to also concur. He will never violate God's word. He will never contradict God's word. He will always agree with the king of glory, and then he'll come back and begin to have dialogue with us. And now the tables of negotiation have changed. And we're in the corner and he's saying, listen, you have no evidence that this is going to work out in your favor. But if you'll trust me to do it his way, it'll be okay. Here's another one from the Old Testament in Exodus 40. Moses could no longer enter the tabernacle because the cloud had settled down over it. It had settled there. And then finally, back to Ruth chapter 3. Naomi said to Ruth, the man won't rest until he has settled things today. Now that's a slight twist on the context that I've been using for the word settled, but I want you to hear it in light of him being a picture in the book of Ruth, him, Boaz, being a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not going to rest now until he has settled things for you. He will never rest until he has settled your situation, until he has settled your diagnosis, until he has settled your healing from that thing, your breakthrough from that thing, your enlightenment, deliverance, breakthrough, change, challenge, change, transformation. He will not stop until he has settled that thing. He'll settle in the courts of heaven and he'll settle it in your soul. He's going to settle it for you because he, that's who he is. That's what he does. And when we think of this situation, Naomi says something profound. He's not going to do anything else until he settles your situation. Oh, if we could get a hold of that and just hold on to it. Come on, gang. Forty years ago, as a 15-year-old boy, 
I went to church, and, and my mom's friend was telling me what one of the messages was about. I didn't even remember it, but she was remembering. I said, come on, you got to do, do better than that. you got to dig out those dates somewhere. you got those dates written down. And she was telling me what the, I don't remember any of the preaching. What I remember was that there was uh, an atmosphere in that place, and somehow inside of me I knew something was going to be settled that night. Amen? Here's the last thing tonight or this morning. Look at Acts verse, chapter 2, verse 4. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. What happened on the day of Pentecost in 33 AD? Number one, something came suddenly. We're not exactly sure what it was. It was like a mighty windstorm, but it, what we are sure of is it came suddenly. Number two, something settled on them. Even though everyone saw it, they were not sure exactly what it was. It was like this and like that, but what we do know is it settled on them. We're not sure exactly. Number three, something filled them. Something came suddenly, something settled on them, and something filled them. Now, Peter gives the scriptural prophetic support to this from the book of Joel. But there are few other Old Testament scriptures that refer to the personal encounter that the church would have with the Holy Spirit. Why? Why would God not clearly spell out in the Old Testament? We, we quote some verses, Isaiah, with people from a, another nation with stammering lips. I'll speak to this. And we, we somehow say, well, that's, that's, that's kind of how the baptism is and the, the experience with the Holy Spirit that you read about in Acts chapter 2 and 4. But that, that, to me, that's a little bit of a stretch. And, and you can say, well, there, there should be more Old Testament support for this. It, it should have directives and explanations and descriptions, and it should tell us all about it. But Luke is telling us why that doesn't exist. He's giving us the insight as to why. Because we don't know exactly what came suddenly. And we don't know exactly what settled on them. But we know exactly what filled them. See, here's what we forget. Is that you can say, well, it's like this or like that. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, there's nothing else like him. His experience with you, you being baptized in him, there is nothing else that comes close. You can't compare it to anything. You can't measure it by any measurement. And when it comes, you will know it without a doubt. There is absolutely not a cell in your body. There's not a thought in your mind that can look at the power and the presence and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and say that it's anything but that. This is that. That's why Peter stood up and said, I don't care what you think it is. This is that. We don't need any witness. We don't need the Old Testament. The, the, scripturally, yes. What we know is God is conveying things by his word, but when God shows up, everybody knows it, even Satan. Amen? Everybody knows it. You don't have to dig for references and study out the Hebrew text. Ha hallelujah. Oh, that's wonderful. But when the Holy Spirit comes and fills you, you know exactly what's happened. People can mock you and criticize you. They can reject you and cut you off, say you're never coming back to this family. You're never coming back to this church. You'll never be a part of this movement again. And all you do is say, well, hallelujah. I am filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't care about that, this, or the other. Glory. They knew. They didn't know. They didn't know. But then they knew. That's what the Holy Spirit's telling us, I believe. They were not sure what the sound was, not sure what the sight was, but they were absolutely sure what the speaking was. Anytime the Holy Spirit is present in any person or in any place, he is recognized. Even Jesus wasn't recognized on the road to Emmaus with his own disciples. But when the Holy Spirit comes, he's always recognized. There is nothing else that can produce holiness in the universe. Nothing. Nothing. And every creature, great and small, recognizes holiness the moment they see it. You can mock it, you can try to imitate it, but you can't provide it or produce it. Only he can. We get caught up on the spirit and the speaking, but you can't get to the spirit or the speaking until you start with holy. 
Now, here's the good news, some more good news. You don't have to make yourself holy to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Back 100 years ago, we preached in Pentecostal churches, come, come with your cigarettes and your beer, come with your affairs and your entanglements, come with your addictions. This was back before there was a whole lot of known drug addiction, and we certainly didn't know anything about, about transgender or none of that. I saw a headline early, the other day, and I meant to bring it this morning. Um, it's now called a throuple. Have you heard this term? It's three people. And this throuple happens to be three husbands. And they're two boys that they've adopted. And what a happy family they are. I guess somewhere they got a marriage license or maybe they just call themselves three husbands. I don't know. And I hope I haven't just ruined your kids or your lunch or just broken into your, and you think your 12-year-old's never heard anything like that. And they're laughing at me for not even knowing what it was till now. I don't care how lost you are. I don't care for how many generations in your family you've run away from God, mocked God, made fun of everything about God. You never thought this was coming. You never, never dreamed that this is what. When we began to vote okay for this and the court said yes to that and everything was just going to be fine and dandy and everything was going to be peaches and cream, you never, never did you see this kind of garbage coming ever. It's going to be okay. That's what they said to Sodom, and everything was okay until it wasn't. <laughs> He's the Holy Spirit of God, the unmistakable, inimitable, life changing, miracle working, power giving, interceding, pleading, advocating witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. In every party, He shows up to witness about Jesus. In every courtroom, He shows up to witness about Jesus. On every job site, every construction site, in every office, in every church, in every baptistry, in every place on this planet where there is property, land, terra firma, everywhere there is a person or not, everywhere that the Spirit of God is. He testifies to the glory of the risen Christ Jesus. Everywhere he goes, he tells about Jesus. Everybody he sees, he tells about Jesus. Whether you open your mouth or not, when you're a spirit-filled believer and you walk into that elevator, you just brought the Holy Spirit with you. And he's testifying that Jesus Christ is alive and coming back soon. Hallelujah. Part of what happens, people who are not Pentecostals, you non-Pentecostal Methodists, Presbyterians, Anglicans, Episcopalians, you non-Pentecostal Baptists and Catholics. And you you, you want to say, well, it's just that. It's that zeal. And they work it up. And they, they get to this fervored pitch of saying, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And then, then it just becomes all emotion. And they, they just start speaking gibberish. You've got it absolutely backwards and wrong. We don't reach a certain place of ecstasy and then not have any of our faculties, and now we're running our mouth in gibberish. What happens is we come to the end of the flesh. And too many people in churches here in America never want to get to the end of their flesh because they love the flesh. They celebrate the flesh. They honor the flesh. They worship the flesh. They obey the flesh. And they still want to come into church and say glory to God. But when you come to the end of your flesh in Jesus Christ and you say, that's all I've got, the Holy Spirit says, I've been waiting for that. Let me take over. You got to the end of yourself and you didn't get emotional. You got surrendered. Well, Pastor, it's never happened to me. But it can. And it should. Because of the times we live in, not because of the times we're going into. Listen, you let your kids witness enough flesh when they're 8, 10, 12 years old, you won't be able to count the splits in the highway of their life, the forks in the road that they change, choose wrong every time. You'll be dismayed, disheartened, and eventually totally depressed. But if they see you, even with your mistakes and your imperfections, they see you finding a place in the Holy Spirit where he comes suddenly and he stays uh, having settled on you and allows you to speak something of the Spirit of God. When they see that, they'll overlook all that other stuff and they'll say, there's something real in my house. My mom and dad have something real. My stepmom knows how to get a hold of God. My stepdad isn't letting only that, any of that hold him back. He's got a relationship with the Holy Spirit. 
But across this nation, we've got people who have worshipped the flesh and talked about God. And then they're stunned when their kids or grandkids choose the flesh. And every generation chooses a darker flesh, and I don't mean racially, a darkness in the flesh that's at a lower level than anything previous. We are way beyond my notes right now. I don't even know how we got where we're at. We're going to take time this morning and pray. And I want you to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. He, he comes suddenly. It might happen in this place. And I don't want you to worry about Billy Bob that's beside you or Cousin Louie that's in front of you. I want you to, to just allow your person to be caught up and in to the presence of Jesus by yourself. And in those moments, I want you to say to the Lord, would you come suddenly and would you settle on me? Our service hostess was right behind the young lady the other day when she was hit. And that's looped in her mind. She saw it. But the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. That's all we have. When you come into his presence, he knows exactly what you need. And he wants to come upon you and baptize you. And all of that. Every day we get baptized in the garbage around us. Sometimes we've got to come in here and just get baptized in the holiness of God. And in those moments, I'm going to pray with you and pray for you. And if the Holy Spirit settles on you suddenly, and you're saying, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, glory to God, glory to God, and something else begins to stir and bubble, you do not have to to swallow hard and ignore everything. You're in a church where we don't want you to get to the end of your flesh and say, I'm going back. We want you to get to the end of your abilities. When I say flesh, I'm not just talking there about the sinfulness of us, but I'm also talking about our abilities to worship in our humanity. You get to that point at the end of yourself and don't stop. Brother Sandy prayed for me. And an hour later, I was still standing there. I, nobody told me what I was supposed to do. Hallelujah. Because they knew it didn't matter. It wasn't up to them to tell me what to do. They just let me go. He broke down on the interstate. Just a young guy in his 20s. Spirit-filled Jewish believer found the pastor at the church that my mom's friend attended. She was Polish Catholic, still Polish Catholic to this day, but the charismatic movement had come, and they had been having encounters with the Holy Spirit at the church. She started going Sunday nights to a Pentecostal church. Young guy breaks down on the highway, finds this pastor, and the pastor says, oh, why don't you just stay and do a weekend meeting for us? Who does that? I stood in Pakistan in March in front of more than 50,000 people to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Two nights before, I gave the invitation for those to get saved in a place where 15,000 people were gathered. I didn't see any hands that weren't up. Those services are playing on their television all day and all night because the Holy Spirit came suddenly caused a car to break down, a pastor to host a spontaneous revival, a woman to invite her friend and kids, and an invitation to have an encounter. Come on, stand with me this morning. The Holy Spirit is in this place. The wind is, my God in heaven, the wind is blowing. Oh, I can't tell you I, I can't tell you exactly what it is. It comes suddenly 
and settles. I, I, can't, I can't even explain that. What I can tell you is it filled me. We've got to get desperate in America. We've got to get desperate in Maryland. We've got to get desperate in Central Assembly. Last week, we had a young guy at his parents' house just a block down from us overdose and die. That was just a few hours after somebody overdosed and died in a hotel over in LaVale. Same day. Come on, when have you had enough flesh? We got to get beyond the flesh. Amen. Father, this morning, we're in this house because we know there's something that we desperately need. We know that there's something beyond us. There's a power. There, 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 there's something miraculous that we cannot access, even as believers, until we go beyond the flesh, until we step into something glorious. They couldn't say exactly what it was like wind, maybe. They couldn't say exactly how it came down like fire maybe, but they knew that it had come suddenly and they knew that it settled on them, but what they knew exactly was it filled them, filled every one of them, not just the group, but filled Peter and John, filled Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ, filled all of them. Every single believer was in that room, all the known believers on the planet earth in that room, and it filled every one of them. May you come today and fill every one that's in this church. Glory to God. Everyone watching us right now, in Jesus' name, prepare to be filled. I want our prayer teams to come. If you need a touch in your body, you need a healing physically. I want some of you ladies to pray for Sister Elizabeth today. Maybe you need a healing inwardly somehow, however you want to describe it. But that's what these teams are for, to pray for you and your needs. But those of you who are hungry now for an encounter, for your own personal encounter with the Holy Spirit, I want you to stay right where you are. And Sister Pam is going to lead us in a, in a little bit of worship, and then I'm going to begin to pray with you. And then I'm going to step out of the way, and, and I'm going to believe with you, and trust with you, and watch you as the Holy Spirit comes suddenly and settles down on you and fills you. Glory to God.